Welcome to Mistara for part two of our look at the undead, because the known world loved its walking around dead critters. This time we are headed to the land of crimson dirt, terrible curses, and Texans, the Savage Coast. When the immortals decide to pass on multiple messed up maledictions, you get really messed up undead. Only now with a Cinebril twist, kind of like Taco Bell. So who are these red-tinged creatures of darkness? Where do you find them and how do you kill them? I'm Mr. Welch and prepare your remove curse spells everybody. We're headed back to the Savage Coast to see what's shaken. Going in alphabetical order this time, because unlike the known world, all these monsters come from a single book, the Savage Coast Monsters Compendium, which is free over at the Vaults of Pandius. I'll put a link in the description. There's nine undead in this book, though most of the usual undead make regular appearances as well. I did leave out the Nosferatu, as while it's in this book, it's also in the known world bestiaries as well. So without further ado, let's meet our first contestant. Erishimer Undead Aranea, the Harathian brand of Aranea, not the much less powerful Tanagorian Aranea. As such, it has three forms found in this region's version of all the spider folk, and all three forms appear as zombies in various stages of decay. They keep all the spellcasting abilities they had in real life, and they still prefer illusion and enchantment, and avoid fire magic. Erishimer believed to be what happens when an Aranea tries to become a lich, but falls short. It's still powerful, it's just not lich levels of powerful. They still possess their legacies, though they don't mutate without Cinebril. They do need Cinebril to activate their legacies, so they will keep some on them like spell components. Erishim are despised by their kin. They represent a threat to the secret of the Aranea. The Erishim prefer their spider form over the other two, and they will even strike deals with evil creatures to help them in some endeavor. Well, they won't give away the secret of the spider folk, but the Aranea don't know this. Moreover, the Erishim crave power, and they will try and overthrow Aranea leaders and take their place, ruling through fear. Because of this treachery, the Aranea have a kill on sight policy regarding Erishim. But considering the undead spiders have a lot of their new abilities paired with their high intelligence and magical powers, that's easier said than done. Cursed ones are what you get when someone mutates to death because of a lack of Cinebril. If someone's stats hit zero from a lack of Cinebril, it doesn't matter which one, they die. Unless a special ceremony is performed to sanctify the body, it will rise as a cursed one. They appear as glowing translucent red skeletons and are obsessed with consuming Cinebril, as they are in a constant state of agony without it. They are of low intelligence, and despite their appearance, they aren't evil. They're drawn to Cinebril and will stop at nothing to get it, but they're almost mindless in the pursuit. They will only attack someone possessing Cinebril, attacking mercilessly with each hit draining Cinebril from its victim. If this leaves a victim without Cinebril, it immediately begins to mutate like normal. The Cursed One can't move during the day, so it's only active at night. It can only be hurt by magical or red steel weapons, but only red steel weapons will permanently kill it, otherwise it will rise in a day. Deathmares are what happens when you abuse a horse to death, especially in a sadistic manner. They return as a solid black horse, almost perfect in every way. Which, if you're familiar with the Savage Coast, you will immediately recognize that as a clue. In the Cursed Lands, everyone is tinted red, a detail that a lot of people miss. The Deathmare will act docile and friendly, often acting like it's hungry or thirsty, and will even obey commands. But once you get on, the monster comes out. You are stuck on the back of a Deathmare unless someone has a Remove Curse spell handy. The horse will immediately try to kill its rider by riding into a river or throwing itself off a cliff. If the horse's nature is recognized or nobody wants to ride it, it will attack immediately. They hunt for their previous owner, and as soon as they kill him, they fade away. Inheritor liches are the most powerful undead found in the Savage Coast, and possibly all of Mistara. Seriously, these guys give night dragons a run for their money. Fortunately, there's only two of them known. One is the Doom Rider, found in the Savage Baronies, and the other one is Death Flame, found in Renardi. When an Inheritor wizard becomes a lich, they become a supercharged one, thus the Inheritor Lich. Both of the known liches are level 15, whether this is a level cap placed on them by the process, or simply because that's the highest level Inheritor to so far become a lich is unknown. Both of them possess seven legacies each, and will use them as early and as often as possible. The Inheritor Lich does not have all the powers of a traditional lich. For example, it doesn't automatically generate a fear effect that causes low-level victims to flee. Its reputation alone does that. It possesses all the abilities of its class in life. If a cleric somehow became an Inheritor Lich, it would still have clerical spells. Its most feared ability is its Curse Touch. Get hit by one, and you get to make a saving throw, or you mutate exactly like you ran out of Cinebril. Doesn't matter if you actually have Cinebril, you still mutate and get all the bad effects normally. If you don't have a legacy, the Inheritor Lich gives you one. Then you mutate. And no, you actually don't get the power, just the mutation associated with it. The power doesn't seem to be restricted to the cursed regions. Doom Rider can walk around Ausland red cursing Vikings right and left if he wanted to. And if you have multiple legacies already, like an Inheritor does, if you fail the save, you get all the mutations. 
that's going to drop some stats real quick. Their phylactery is a red steel item, hidden away probably in a pile of red steel items. Unless you can completely destroy it with either a disintegrate spell or the detonate legacy, then it's going to be coming back. Inheritor liches are practically indestructible. They have tons of spells, and worse, use your own powers against you. So, good luck if you face one. The spawn of Nemur is what happens when a powerful Nemorian manscorpion dies from exposure to the sun. Remember, these manscorpions don't get the moonlight excuse. Any light on the surface burns them. That's why they have to wear heavy clothes and cover all exposed skin with makeup. But if that's not enough and one gets stuck outside and burns, there's a chance it turns into a spawn. They reform their body, from ash if necessary, and that's pretty necessary most of the time. They get some standard undead resistances like needing magic items to hit them. They also become much more powerful in combat with a dreaded poison that gives a massive penalty to save, killing on a failure, and even if you pass the test, it permanently lowers a physical stat. They are regarded as heroes in their culture, as any man scorpion that can rise from the dead after facing the wrath of the sun is worthy of respect. They still take damage from the sun, but it can't permanently kill them. They will reform like they rose the first time, unless a special ritual is performed over their ashes. The Ziggurat Horror is made in a similar fashion to the spawn of Nemur, but they are far less powerful. The ritual to make these monsters is a well-guarded secret by the man scorpions, but they are only slightly more powerful than zombies. They are almost identical in appearance to spawn, so most people encountering them won't be able to tell the difference. They are turned to zombies, have a poison that does straight damage with no lingering effects, but they're also found in packs guarding the ziggurats, while the spawn of Nemur is only ever found alone. The heroic spirit is one of the rarest forms of undead in all of D&D, one that can keep its alignment after death. There are just as many good aligned heroic spirits as evil, which doesn't make a lot of sense for something called heroic because there's not a lot of heroic villains because that would make them villainous, and if it was called a villainous spirit, you wouldn't expect it to be good, would you? Regardless, the heroic spirit can be any one of the nine alignments, and its purpose is to help someone fulfill a task or defeat an evil it failed to do so while it's alive. Which again is confusing, because it specifically says the unfinished task is some heroic deed, and the undefeated opponent is some dastardly villain. Okay, forget what the book says. The heroic spirit is a good guy, that's his description, so that bit about the alignment being of any alignment is a typo. The spirit is invisible and intangible, possessing people it considers worthy in furthering its goals. No, possession is the wrong word. The spirit acts as a conscience, helping and guiding its host to finish the task or defeat the villain. It can't control its host, but provides bits of wisdom and even improves the host's fighting abilities using the spirit's superior prowess. In game terms, the spirit gives the host the benefits of a potion of superheroism or the equivalent whenever a fight starts. You gain this ability for a minimum of 4 rounds up to a maximum of 15 but it's capped by the number of mooks you're fighting. If you're fighting one guy, you get this ability for four rounds. If you're fighting six guys, you get six rounds of existence, and after that, you should have already won. You also get the equivalent of the luck legacy, even if it's dormant. The last, and possibly best, ability is if you help the spirit achieve its goals, you get bonus XP. The first time you realize you have a spirit helping you, and again when you've completed the spirit's tasks. Then, and only then, does the spirit manifest. It thanks you for your help, and it finally moves on to its well-deserved rest. It's a plot hook mechanic, but it's a hell of a plot hook mechanic. The Shadow Symbiont is a strange creature, appearing as a set of matched clothing made out of black cloth. The full creature is a mask, cloak, boots, and a pair of gloves. They all look very stylish and will adapt to the wearer regardless of size. That's because the clothes are an undead creature fresh from the Plane of Shadow. They aren't evil. They are true neutral all the way, and they will lay out what they do and what the cost is. Then it's up to the character to decide if the cost is worth it. There is no coercion, no trickery, and no backing out once you've agreed. You put on the clothes of your own free will and accept the consequences, or the Shadow Symbiont looks for the next possible host. What the Symbionts provide are magical spells at will, at the cost of permanently losing experience points. The cost is 10 or 20 experience points, modified by various factors like level or damage absorbed, which is immediately drained from the character with no way of getting them back. The Masks makes you immune to mind-affecting magic as long as you want to. The cloak absorbs magical damage at the low cost of 10 points per hit point saved. The gloves give you the lucky legacy for 20 times your level. And lastly, the boots let you dimension door for 10 times your level. You can do this as much as you want, but remember you're losing XP every time. If you run out of XP and try to use it, the symbiont drags you back to the plane of shadows, and that's where you get eaten. Don't violate the terms of agreement with these guys. You can attack them, they have hit points and an armor class, but after the first turn, they shift back to the plane of shadows and they remember you. If you aren't convinced the Harathi and Aranea aren't the poster childs for unintended consequences, let me introduce you to the Yisham. 1500 years ago, a 
bunch of Aranea decided they wanted to be immortal, become better shape changers, and gain more magic. The result was a transformation into an undead black pudding-like creature with all sorts of spells and the ability to change into any creature, as long as they looked like they were covered in black tar. At first, the Harathians who underwent this process kept their sanity, but eventually they went cackling madman insane. The Yeshim are a terrifying sight in combat, something they enjoy because it disrupts the monotony of their existence. They have the spellcasting abilities of a 14th to 18th level wizard, and they can envelop their enemies where they gain all the knowledge and memories of its victims. You have to kill the Yeshim to free the victim, but the victim can be killed within an action by the monster. They are immune to all sorts of manner of magical damage, as well as a host of spells. They are unrepentant killers that will depopulate an area just because they're bored. So be warned. Lastly, we get the Red Zombies, which are created in one of two ways. First, just cast Animate Dead on someone who is afflicted with the Red Curse. The second way is through a disease that drains a non-afflicted person's constitution score to zero, and then they rise as a Red Zombie. In the latter case, the creature has no legacies, but if they were animated, they have all the legacies they had in life. Red Zombies can detect Cinebril and attack Cinebril wearers on sight. They have standard zombie immunities, though they take double damage from red steel weapons. They do destroy Cinebril when they attack, depleting one ounce per point of damage inflicted, or a day's use per point of damage. They can be deadly with legacies, but they're just above basic zombies and have about as much toughness. That concludes Undead of the Savage Coast. They're a nasty bunch, with some epic level encounters as well as some truly unique monsters. Remember, these were all written for 2nd edition, the least used of the two editions of Mastara. There's a lot of evil villains, some seriously nasty mooks, and one guy that works as a great plot point and a lesson in proofreading. Next week I'm going to talk about the Nation of Aquarindi, which will probably also finally get me to revise the Sea People's Gazetteer, which sounds redundant. But until then, it is by no means an irrational fantasy that in a future existence we shall look upon what we think our present existence as a dream.